fond memories. Uh, come back here as often as I can. Uh, one thing about the slide that I want to point out to you, maybe it is subliminal. Uh, when I first walked in, the name of my slide was Kentucky First in the Nation Summit. And Ms. Sell said, well, that's not really the name of the conference. It's Kentucky Leads the Nation Summit. So she was kind enough to change it. But I think what I, the reason I put that first in the nation summit there in the first place is to give credit to some of the things that have happened in this state that maybe you all take for granted, but the rest of the country does not. Some of the earliest reform language that began the debate on how education can be reformed in this country began in Kentucky with the Kentucky Education Reform Act. Now I know that it's gone through a lot of changes and you all had robust debates about the value of that piece of legislation and its antecedents here in Kentucky. But if you talk to any education historian that focuses on reform, Kentucky is one of the states that's mentioned first as being willing to take on that issue of how to reform education in the public system. On the most recent side, Kentucky was the first state in the country to adopt the Common Core Standards in Math and Language Arts, which in and of itself is significant because it gave a signal to the rest of the country that these were reliable indices of progress. This was a reasonable and appropriate way to measure student achievement, not just for students in Kentucky, but students across the country. So don't take for granted that what issues you debate in Kentucky aren't being watched by the rest of the country. They certainly are. I take you now to 1983. Some of you were around when a report was issued called A Nation at Risk. It was commissioned by then President Ronald Reagan. He asked the then Secretary of the Department of Education, Ted Bell, who was a former state superintendent in Arizona, to impanel this group of experts <coughs> for a couple of reasons. One, there was pressure to close the Department of Education. And there was, a, there was an issue about whether or not we, as a separate agency of government, even needed to exist. But third, there was a growing concern that we were losing ground to the rest of the world in the connection between education and how that education promoted economic development and opportunity. This was written on page five of the report when it was handed to the president. If an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. As it happens, we have allowed this to happen to ourselves. Some of the authors of that report commented that they, in their research, had discovered that we had not maintained our vitality in challenging the education status quo, that we were comfortable enough with where we were that it was always going to be good enough and failed to realize that other countries that are now our chief competitors realized that education was as much an element of economic prosperity as anything else they chose to do. And you would have thought that back then we would have made an impact. And each day when I get up and I read the news reports and scan the news clippings and hear reports from across the country, I wonder if we're making an impact. Here we are more than 25 years later, after this red alert was signaled that we've got to focus back on education. We've got to accept the challenge and do things differently, promote it in a way that takes advantage of the progress that the rest of the world is making. So let's see where we are today. Today, 25 to 27 percent of our kids drop out of school before they get their high school diploma. In some communities, maybe some of those that you represent, it's higher than that. I've been in some communities where the dropout rate is over 60%. Now, those members of the legislature, anybody here that runs a business, maybe the business is the school system. If you go to work tomorrow and a third of your employees chose not to show up anymore, what that would do to the productivity of your operation, what that would do to the productivity <clears throat> of the legislative branch or the executive branch or an insurance company or the Ford Motor Plant down the road. Yet we allow that to happen in education every day. 
we allow kids to slip through the cracks and disappear without ever having the opportunity to reach their potential. Is it deliberate? Absolutely not. <coughs> but it doesn't have to be inevitable either. Now, we'll never have a perfect system there. Every kid graduates high school. We'll always have kids that don't see that in their future. But 25%, one quarter of kids that go to high school never finish? I don't know that we can tolerate that as a nation and still recover our prosperity. Only 40% of our adult learners earn a two-year or four-year degree. 30 to 40% of those go on to a four-year institution require remedial education. Now think about that for a second. This is, this is my bad because I'm in education and I've been in education since my hair was brown and my teeth were white. So I've been doing this a while at the local level, at the state level, and now at the national level. You look at kids that graduate from high school and meet the state standards for re getting a diploma. They walk across the street and they go to one of the fine community colleges or technical schools or four-year institutions in Kentucky and they say, welcome, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is you're accepted into our university. The bad news is you have to spend the next six months of remedial education because you're not ready to do college level work. What was high school for? How did I get a diploma? if I wasn't ready to transact that education and make an informed choice to come to university. So we've got some work to do in our community to make certain that that balance is reasonable, to make certain that there is a, an alignment that is appropriate if we want kids to reach a level of, high, of college matriculation that will increase the value of our productivity as a workforce. You could walk across the, the main walkway in the Kentucky State Fair th this evening and ask any 10 people where they think the United States ranks in science with the rest of the world. If we were in a, in a deficit situation, I'd offer you $10 a head for anybody that told you we were 17th out of 29th in the developed countries in science performance among 15-year-olds, or 24th out of 29th in the world in math. The attention that we're giving to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math is because we are losing our edge in creating those innovative opportunities that have always been the hallmark of the collaboration between our quality education and our quality economic prosperity. What's sad about that second statistic is some of you may be familiar with a report that's issued called the International Math and Science Survey, which does a an occasional assessment of students from across the world on internationally normed tests. We're not talking about expectations that you only have to be able to speak Czech or Spanish or Chinese in order to do well. But on norm tests that 15-year-olds across the world who have done well in math or science should be able to do. In the 80s, we were 17th out of 29. So we've got our work cut out for us. Is it deliberate? No, it's not deliberate. We're not intentionally dumbing down our curricula so that our kids don't perform as well as their counterparts, their peers do in the rest of the world. And this is more a, an amplification of the wake up call that we've got to focus our collective attention on education reform as it relates to the quality of opportunity provided to kids at all grade levels. I said this at the table, when I was in college, the United States was number one in the world in college completion. Today we're 10th. The good news is, back in September of, 10, of, 9, of 2010, we were 11th, so we're making progress. But we're not a nation that is used to being 10th in anything. These are pieces of information that most people don't know. Yet we in education know it, and I believe are working tirelessly to overcome some of the challenges that we face with a more diverse student body. The reality of restrained budgets. The diversity of challenges that come to state and local school systems. How we do that is up to our collective discussion to resolve. I don't think there's one answer. 
but there needs to be an answer because I don't know that we can prosper with these continuing declines. So perhaps Secretary Duncan was right when he said education is a civil rights issue of our generation, where it takes a collective community commitment to address issues of economic and, and academic equity so the kids will have the opportunity to succeed because of what we provided for them, what our avenues of opportunity we've made available to them. We believe that education is a right for all kids. Will all kids be A students and go to University of Kentucky, University of Louisville? Probably not. But is it not a fair goal for us to provide kids the information they need to make that choice and be prepared to take those steps, whatever road they choose to follow? So we have this blueprint for reform, which came out in the fall of 2010 when we were hopeful that Congress would be able to put on its calendar a debate about reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which is in this current environment better known as No Child Left Behind. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act has been around since 1965 and it's been known by many different popular titles. The current iteration in No Child Left Behind is what most people are familiar with because it's the most uh, accessible of any of the elementary and secondary act statutes that we've had since 65. What this blueprint does is identify what we would change in the statute to make it more appropriate to the education reform initiatives we believe are important to regenerate the engine of academic reform that was part of what made us so strong earlier in our generation. Now, that's my boss there on the, uh, the front, the closest to us. I don't know who that guy next to him is. Uh, one thing about Arnie Duncan is he's the, he's the second, super, uh, second secretary in our history that comes with local school experience. He was preceded by Dr. Rod Page, who was former superintendent of schools in Houston. And Arnie Duncan was Secretary of, of Education, or actually Executive Director of Education in Chicago Public Schools for 10 years. He comes from a background of working in low-income communities. His mother ran an after-school program for at-risk youth in South Suburban Chicago. So he comes with some perspective on the challenges of revitalizing education. Uh, those of you that have ever met him or you've seen him, he's a pretty tall guy. He's around six foot 80, he's a bit tall guy. And we were at a site one day and he gets out of the car and he grabs at his back. And I asked him if he had hurt himself. And he said, well, as a matter of fact, I did. I got hurt playing basketball last night. When you play basketball at that level, you don't go home until you go hard. <laughs> and I, that's kind of become a metaphor for what we're facing in education. That this is not, the kind of recovery we're talking about is not for the weak of heart requires long hours, hard decisions, difficult choices, robust discussions, because the kind of changes we are talking about require time, commitment, and compassion. We can't go home until we go hard because there's too much at stake by turning around and not taking up the challenge that this represents. So this is our goal. By the year 2020, America will once again have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. What that means is that by the year 2020, 8 million more people have to graduate from, high, from college than are graduating today. Those 8 million kids are already in school. They're already enrolled and they're making their way through elementary school. Our goal is to make it virtually impossible for them not to see college, at least a one year or two year college experience as an avenue for their own personal prosperity. If we can get them into college, they have a chance to make some informed choices about what they want to do with the rest of their lives. But we've got to get them into college first, or at least get them into some form of post-secondary training that gives them a chance to see how what they've learned applies in a real-world environment where they can make a more informed choice.